Good morning, happy Mother's Day, and welcome to Lake Ridge. We are so glad to have you worshiping with us today. Wasn't that a beautiful way to start the service? First hour, I didn't do that in the right order, so they sang after me, but I liked it better this way. <laughs> um, for those of you that are visiting the first time, please take a moment to stop by our welcome desk in the foyer. We wanna greet you by name, get to know you, and help you get connected here at Lake Ridge. So make sure to stop by on your way out this morning. Also, you'll find we have connection cards in the pews. Please be sure to fill this out. They are in replacement of our attendance pads, so this is how we know when you're worshiping with us. Um, there's also a place for you to play, put down a prayer request, and we really want to be praying for your needs. Um, and so if you could share that through the connections card, you also can send us a direct message via Facebook um, and Instagram, or you can go to the care section of our website and place your prayer request there. And you can always call the church office and ask for Suzanne Wampler, and you can talk to her about any prayer requests that you or your family has. Um, and don't forget to check inside your bulletin for other events going on here at Lake Ridge. And now will you please stand with me in a responsive reading of Psalms 136 as an opening act of worship. I will start with the leader portion. Please join me with the people portion. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love, steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, to his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spreads out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. To the sun, or the sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. To the moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever. And rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you all this beautiful Mother's Day morning. Um, man, we've had a morning up here. I'm, I'm just going to let you all know. Um, we may be frazzled a little bit, but I, what I want to what I want to come to you with, what I want to let you know is that no matter what else happens, no matter what you've got going on in your life right now, God is only interested in where your heart is right now. And that's all that he wants. That's all that he asks for. That's all that he requires is your heart. So we invite you to give him that this morning as we worship. Yeah. 
There's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sins. Sun, moon, and stars in 
sad and dormant, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with ten thousand for this time of prayer, we invite you forward to the altar as always. Just come and lay, lay your burdens down at the foot of the cross, at the feet of Jesus. If you would also uh, direct your attention to the screen, we have a short, short video for Mother's Day. Today is a unique day, and it's far bigger than we think, because there are many different kinds of mothers, and all are being honored today. For the mother who's chosen to stay at home while her children are little, may your patience be great and your influence even greater. For the single mom who never planned on doing this alone, may you be consistently strengthened by your Heavenly Father, and may you hear His voice singing over you. For the mother who strives to balance work outside the home with love inside the home, may you be given energy, validation, and hope as you make the leap from one world to another every day. For moms who had poor mothers themselves, but who now refuse to let that pattern repeat itself, may the godly legacy you've started be carried on for generations to come. For mothers with grown adult children, may today be filled with laughter and joy and may you experience deep satisfaction and fulfillment. For women who have no biological children of their own, but who mother younger women as mentors, may you understand your role as a calling from God and as a transformation of their hearts. Today is a unique day, so for all the mothers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be blessed, be honored, be filled with joy. You are making the world a better place because you're filling it with a love that only a mom can give. Dear Heavenly Father, today we lift up all the mothers and women as part of our congregation today. And we just want you to, to bless them and honor them in whatever type of mother they are, in whatever phase of life that they're in. We, we know that you made them unique and special for a specific purpose. And we are so thankful that you have blessed us with those special jobs and intentions. And just want to lift up all the mothers today and so many of us may find ourselves in a mothering situation that we did not anticipate it may not motherhood may not look like what we thought it would 
Um, and I especially want to lift up those that are in pain or are hurting today in, in either loss of a mother, loss of a wife, um, loss of a child, that you fill them with love, that they know that you're walking with them, that you love them, that you are with them. Father, we, we want to take that hurt away from them, um, and we lift them up to you, that, um, that you can fill that gap of, of emptiness for them. We also lift up um, mothers that they, they feel empowered to know that they are doing the very best that they can. Mothering is such a hard job, and it's hard to know um, if you're making the right choices. And we just ask that you honor those decisions that moms are making, that they're making them through guidance from you, that they're seeking you in their decisions, and that you are empowering them to um, just live out this job that you have blessed them with. And um, we just are so thankful for every type of mother and woman in this room that they are fulfilling that special purpose that you have designed them for. And we are thankful for all types of mothers today and, and every day. And we just appreciate them so much in the way that they bless and change our lives and the way that they're doing that through the special gifts that you've given them, Father. So we just praise you for creating mothers of all types for us to be blessed by through you. Um, and now let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There we go. Uh, we invite you to continue worshiping this morning with us in the giving of your tithes offerings and extra dollars. to me. 
Good morning, church. Am I on? Am I on? Okay, all right. Just want to make sure I didn't mess that up. It's good to be with you this morning. We want to welcome all of you who are joining us online as well. It's great to have you on this Mother's Day Sunday. We are launching into a new message series this morning. It's entitled Zip It. And you may be thinking, where did you come up with that title? Well, when I was in junior high, I had a teacher, and she shall remain nameless, uh, but she used to look at us, uh, junior high students, and she would say, zip it, as in close your mouths, quit talking, uh, enough. And and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the power of the words that we speak. Jesus himself said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we're going to take on some things that that might hit close to home, might even step on a few toes. We're going to talk about lying and criticism and gossip. But today we're going to start with complaining. All right, so in honor of Mother's Day, I did a little research and I found on the internet what are determined to be the five major complaints that school-age children will have this summer. All right, now if you're a school-age child, I triple dog dare you to prove me wrong. All right, so here it is. Here is the, the list, the top five. Number five, completing chores. Number four, having a curfew. It's not a school night, right? Why can't I stay up as late as I want to? Number three, why can't I have someone over? Number two, there is nothing to eat as they stand in front of a fully stocked pantry, right? And the number one, right? Let's give me a drum roll on the back of the pews there, right? Help me out. Number one, I'm bored, right? And the moms are all going, I could have given you that list. You didn't have to research it. Just ask me. I'd tell you what that is. I think all of our moms have probably heard that before. Now, when I think about complaining, though, and I think about the Bible, my mind immediately goes to the Old Testament, and I think about the Israelites. I think about God's chosen people. They um, have been living in captivity in Egypt. They have hard, difficult lives. They're, They're living as slaves. And so what did they do as a result of that? They complained. And they complained, and they complained some more. And so they they were just complaining, but the Lord heard their cry. And so God hears their cry and raises up Moses to be a deliverer for them. And in the midst of that situation, God does amazing, miraculous things that, that they witness just right in front of them. Like I think about God sending all the plagues that he sent so that uh, Pharaoh would relent and let the people go. They, they saw that happen. They saw God move in that way. I think about when they make it to the Red Sea and how they saw God part the Red Sea so they could walk across on dry land. And then when Pharaoh's army comes charging after them, as soon as the the last Israelite puts a foot on the other side of the Red Sea, what happens? It closes back up and all of Pharaoh's army is completely destroyed. I think about as they're going toward the, the promised land, what does God do? He provides them manna from heaven, food that they need for each new Day And so over and over and over again, they see God move in these miraculous ways. And you know what they did? They griped and they whined and they complained. And here is what we find when we pick up with this story in Exodus chapter 14, beginning with verse 11. And they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. So that's what Moses has to listen to. And then Moses gives them this really 
poignant, straight, direct reply. He looks at him and he says, your grumbling isn't against us. So if it's not against Moses that they're complaining, if it's not against those that Moses has helping him lead them out, who are they complaining about? The Lord. (laughs) They're complaining to God. They're saying, this is your fault, God. (laughs) Now, what if every time that we feel tempted to complain about something in life, what if we understood that as if we were complaining to the Lord? Would that change anything at all? Now, you might have already gone, gone there as we've been talking about this, but I'm just curious this morning, what is your number one complaint? What's your number one complaint in life? Is it uh, you're complaining that you're not married? Because, or maybe it's this, maybe you are married and that's what you're complaining about, right? Uh, maybe it, it, it's that. Maybe you're complaining that money is tight or maybe that it's your house is too small. Maybe it's your boss drives you crazy or, or maybe it's those meetings that you have to go to and how incredibly boring or, or dull they happen to be. Maybe it's the weather. Maybe it's that the Wi-Fi is slow. Maybe it's that there's nothing to watch on TV. Well, let me tell you, church, the problem isn't the weather and the problem isn't the speed of the Wi-Fi and the problem isn't that Netflix hasn't put out anything new recently. Do you know what the problem is? When we find ourselves complaining in life, I want to suggest to you it is because we have taken our eyes off of God and we have put our eyes squarely on ourselves. When we become the focus, when we become the center of the universe, that is a situation that is ripe for complaining. Now, I think about the Apostle Paul, and what I want us to do is I want us to look at a passage of Scripture that he wrote. And I would just say to you this morning that if there was really anybody that ever had a reason to complain, Paul might have been justified to complain. Because think about this, Paul's number one desire was that he wanted to go to Rome because he wanted to preach there. He felt like Rome would be this incredibly strategic place to go, that he could be incredibly impactful for the kingdom of God if he could go to Rome and preach. But that's not what happens. What happens to Paul? Oh, he ends up in Rome, but it's in a prison. And so he ends up in jail and he is chained to a Roman soldier. And that is his life for almost two years, two years years. And so I'm thinking if I'm Paul and I find myself in that situation, yeah, I think I might be prone to want to complain. But here's what he writes in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Dr. Travis Bradbury wrote an excellent book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it to you. But one of the great things that he says in that book is that whenever we complain and we complain again, that it's a process of hardwiring our brains to continue to complain. So if I have a negative thought, what it does is it ends up feeding a second negative thought and then a third and a fourth, and it just goes on and on and it becomes this cycle until the point I get to where what I experience is called confirmation bias. I expect something bad to happen So what happens? Something bad. That's exactly what I, in turn, experience. And so that's the problem with the Israelites. They were complainers when they were in slavery, and now they are complainers now that they are free. And instead, what the Lord desires for us is that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds, right? That that we would allow the Holy Spirit to come in 
and do the Spirit's work in us, refining us, shaping us, molding us, helping us be more like Jesus in our thinking. Now, based on all of this, based on what Paul has written here in Philippians, I believe that what he would say to us is when you're in a situation in life and you think, I can do something to change this, then do it. Do what you can to make the change. If God has planted something in your heart, if he's given you a holy, godly discontent, then I would encourage you to step up and do something. I I think about Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. The wall around the city has completely collapsed. It is down, they're defenseless. And what does Nehemiah do? He doesn't get out his cell phone and then begin to post on social media about how he can't believe that the wall's down. That's not it. What Nehemiah does is he organizes the people for the purpose of rebuilding the wall. And that's what happens. And so I believe that that Paul is saying here, hey, if you can do something, do it. But here is what I think Paul's next step is off of all of this. If you can't change it, if you cannot change the situation, change your perspective. And I'm not talking about just living in denial that something's wrong or that something is bad, but I am saying that we can make this shift. Paul does it. He does it in Philippians 2, beginning with verse 17. Now remember, he's writing this and he is chained to a Roman soldier, he's in prison. And this is what he writes. But even if, now let's stop there. Those are three really powerful words. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, when Paul says drink offering, everybody that would have read that from from his time, they would have understood it, right? Now, for us, maybe not so much. What would happen is that there would be a priest, and the priest would offer up a sacrifice, maybe a a lamb or or some other animal, but not like a, a crippled lamb or a lame lamb, anything like that. We're talking about a spotless, perfect lamb. And the priest would put that on the altar, and it would be a burnt offering. And then the priest would go and find the most expensive liquid that they had. That's probably going to be wine, right? And so this isn't the cheap stuff, right? This is the really good stuff, the the stuff that, that somebody would really enjoy being able to partake of. But what does the priest do? The priest takes that most expensive, most valuable liquid and pours it out over the top of this burnt offering while it's still hot. And what happens as a result? Smoke rises. Steam comes up off of that burnt sacrifice. And that is the drink offering. It becomes like an incense as an offering to God. Well, some people think in this situation that, that what Paul is doing is he's talking about his ultimate martyrdom. That one day his faith in Jesus is going to cost him his life. But for those of you who are grammar nerds, then there's a really specific word here that we need to pay attention to in Greek. And the word for the drink offering here is spendo, as in I went to United and I spendoed all my money. All right, like you get it. I spent it all, right? And so that's it. Maybe your place is Home Depot or maybe it's Dillard's. I don't know, but you get the idea. It's to spend it all. And so Paul is saying, I have spent all that I have. I have offered up the best that I have. I have given that. And here's the thing. He's not saying one day that might happen. That's not it at all. This is a passive present tense verb. It's even if I'm being poured out, not even if one day I'm poured out. Paul is saying, even as it is oozing out of my life right now, right here in this moment, 
Paul wants us to understand that, that worship, that devoting ourselves to God isn't something you do on a Sunday morning for an hour. This is every day. It is here and it is now and it is in this moment Paul is spending himself for the sake of the gospel in the situation in which he has found himself. So that begs the question, how is it that Paul could be in prison, shackled up with some stinky guard, right? And he's there and he's gonna spend almost two years of his life in that situation, and yet he could find the ability to say, but I rejoice, but I'm gonna praise God. How is that? And what I would say to us, church, is that because Paul is not at the center of his own story. He hasn't made himself the most important person in the room. Jesus is at the center of his life. Jesus is the one who is guiding him and directing him. For him, it is all about Jesus. Philippians 1 12 and 13, Paul says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. In other words, he's saying, I've changed my perspective. This this is advancing the kingdom. This is doing something good. And then he picks back up and he says, as a result, it's become clear through the whole palace guard. They know that I am in chains for Christ. So Paul is kind of at this point, it's like, you may think I'm the prisoner here, but I'm not. You know who the real prisoner is? It's that Roman guard that I get every eight hours, right? That's the prisoner because when he comes in the room, I've got eight hours to influence him. That's eight hours for me in which I can tell him about Jesus and the transformation that he's made in my life and that Jesus can make in his life. I'm gonna be able to talk to him about grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and what it is to follow Jesus. And every eight hours, guess what? They send another guy. How great is that? That's what Paul is saying. But let's be real. For Paul, this is not his plan. This isn't plan A. This is not what Paul would have chosen. But Paul believes in the God that we read about in Romans 8, 28, who can work all things together for our good, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And Paul is saying, I see God at work all over this. I love him, I'm called according to his purposes, even if it's in a Roman prison, I can still achieve God's purposes. I can still be a part of God's plan, even if it wasn't part of my plan. So I would ask you this morning, church, I don't know who this is gonna speak to you. There may be somebody here, maybe, maybe there's a lot more than one somebody here that's going through something hard or difficult, challenging. You're struggling. And your plan A isn't happening. And you don't know what to do. But in this moment, you recognize that God is still on the throne and that he has a purpose and a plan. So, so I just ask you this morning, what are you chained to? And don't say your husband. What are you chained to this morning, church? Maybe it is a broken relationship. Maybe you are, are chained to a job situation. Maybe it's a financial problem. Maybe it's some kind of a health issue that you find yourself chained to today. What are you chained to? And in that moment, you have a choice to make. You can complain about it. And you may be rightly justified in complaining about it, right? You might have a leg to stand on with that. Or, or... <laughs> You can change the way you look at it. Or we can act like Paul did, and we can choose to change our perspective on what it is that we're dealing with that we wouldn't have chosen 
but yet is now our reality. I love when Paul says, but even if. There's power in those three words. It's like a a declaration. It's like Paul is is saying, I'm going to choose to catch a glimpse of the glory of God at work in this situation. That's my mindset. That's what I'm going to do. This is how I am going to approach it. So how do you do that, church? Well, it's real simple, and Paul modeled it for us. We are no longer the center of our own lives. Jesus, would you come and be at the center of my life? Would you be my true north? Would would you be my rock? Would you be my guide, my anchor? Jesus, would you be at the center so that everything else radiates out from there? And when we do that, it changes everything. It changes our perspective Because we live then in the reality that there is a God who loves us, who would never leave us or forsake us or abandon us. A God who will give us the power and the strength that we need for each new day, for whatever situation it is that we find ourselves in. Therefore, you can stand and you can say, I'll rejoice. God, I praise you. Would you pray with me? Father God, um, as I think about the last two days of my life, I've got a list of complaints. I'll just confess I've been keeping them. And I probably had a tendency to air them. Lord, maybe some of us can relate to that. And Father, I just pray that that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit today and that you would renew our minds, Lord, that, that you would transform us so that we might have the mind of Christ. Lord Jesus, we choose today to set ourselves aside. No longer, Lord, do we want to be the center. We don't want to sit on the throne of our own lives. Jesus, you come and be the center. Be our hope. Be our strength. Be our guide. Jesus, There are people here today who are facing tough circumstances. Who if we heard their circumstances, we would probably say, yeah, they've got a right to complain. But Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall on us as a church, as individuals. That you would change our perspective. May the mind of Christ be in us all this day. We pray and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond?
thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. You can be seated. It's been great to worship with you today, and as we conclude our worship service this morning, we have one more act of worship that we want to, uh, to enjoy. Our handbells are going to play another piece for us, and I hope it's a blessing to you today. But receive these words of blessing as well. Go forth from this place in the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ to live with him at the center of your life. Amen.